Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this beautiful evening to come together in your house. We thank you for the safe travels of Pastor Robinson and his family Amen. to come here to bless us with their presence. And I pray that you fill, fill them with your Holy Spirit as he preaches us your word out of Second Timothy. I pray your spirit would be known and uh, we, we'd be edified by it. In Jesus Christ, let me pray. Amen. 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 Well, it's definitely an honor for me to be here, and I definitely am not worthy of that introduction, by the way. Um, but Brother Jeff Hustler has been a, a great friend to me, and so I, um, I, I've been, I've been, I, I think I remember that. But I wanted to go soul winning with him. It's not like, it's not like I wanted to teach him. I just wanted to go soul winning with him. So, uh, but, uh, but Second uh, Timothy chapter two here is a lot. Obviously, we can we can uh, get into here. But what I want to focus on is the very first uh, portion. that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou, therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for mastery, yet is he not crowned except he stri strive lawfully? Yeah. What I want to preach on tonight is uh, what I would call, I guess the title of my sermon would be Preparing for War in Time of Peace. Preparing for War in Time of Peace. Because I, I, I feel like when we're in war and we're in battle and we have persecutions, we're on guard, we're, we're digging in. We're digging in our heels, we're getting into our Bible more than ever. But when there's a time of peace, we tend to step off a little bit. We tend to be a little more idle in our Bible reading because we're not being challenged. But anybody that knows anything about warfare is that you need to be prepared before you get into the battle. Amen. And so when you have the time of peace, you need to look at that as an opportunity to where you're going to actually, you know, get better at what you're doing. Because there's going to be a battle that's going to come, and are you ready for it? Because you don't want to be idle and slothful and just, you know, not doing what you should be doing. And then all of a sudden a battle comes in, into, into your view and you're not ready. And so what I, I, I was kind of thinking about this, this sermon because I, there's another sermon that I was thinking about preaching. And I was going to call it the day after Pentecost. Because you have a big uh, day or a big, you know, uh, you know, let's say a conference or a sowing event. And you have this great victory. But what do you do after that? What do you do after the day after that when everything calms down, when you're not around everybody, and it's just you and the Lord? What do you do? When you don't have the excitement behind when you don't have the persecution that's giving you, and, and don't get me wrong, persecution is exciting. Okay? Now, it can be definitely hard, and we need to endure hardness, but in that hardness and in that persecution, there's excitement. And it may be anxiety, you know, in that excitement, but there's excitement that's there, and it's going to push you to study more. And so what, what I want you to realize is that we're in a war. We're in a war, but there's times of peace within that war until the next battle. And so what we need to realize is that, hey, we need to be ready, and we need to be preparing ourselves for that next battle because it's, go it's going to come. So know that. Know that a battle's coming. Know that persecution's coming. There's going to be a big battle one day, and I don't know what it's exactly going to be about. I don't know when it's going to exactly happen, but it's going to happen. Amen. You know, we had the battle of the repentance of sin stuff that, that was, you know, I, kind of more years ago that that was like a big battle. And then this oneness stuff comes out, and that's another big battle that we had to fight. But don't, don't think that that's going to be the only battle, and that there's not going to be something else that's going to come into view. And so, are you going to be ready? Are you going to be studying your Bible? Are you going to be studying so much that when someone comes out with some false doctrine that, think, that they think is going to be a heavy hitter, you'll actually be ready to just stop them in their tracks and stop the mouths of the gainsayers. But if you're idle during that time, and let's say you get into the next battle and you only know as much as you did in the battle before, don't you know that your enemies are, are going to be wild? They're, 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 they're trying to beat you at your own game, right? You, you, you think Tyler Baker and this one, this stuff, do you think he's going to come at you with the same stuff he came at you last month? Or do you think he's going to find some other ways to twist scripture? Right. He's going to find some other angle. He's going to find some other false doctrine to get in there. So you have to be a step ahead of him. And we need to be above what we think we need to be as far as the battle is concerned. 
But first you need to realize is that God, our God, is a man of war. He's a man of war. In Exodus chapter 15, if you want to turn there, just, just to prove that to you. You know, a lot of people, and, and Christians too, are guilty of this, as far as having a bunch of zeal but no knowledge, mm -hmm. and they don't realize who our God is. The Bible says Amen. God is jealous. Amen. The Lord revenge it. The Lord revenge it and is furious. That's what it says about our God. Yeah. His name is jealous. And the Bible says here in Exodus chapter 15, notice there in verse 2, it says, The Lord is my strength and song, and he's become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him in habitation, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Our God is a man of war. And so when we're, we're, we're supposed to be emulating our God, right? We're supposed to be like him. We're supposed to be following him. We're supposed to be in his steps. And he's a man of war. And he's going to teach us to war. Go to Psalm chapter 18. Psalm chapter 18. Now, a lot of this, you know, when we're dealing with David, David was a man of war physically. He was a mighty man of valor. And he had mighty men that were under him as well. But what we're talking about tonight and what I'll get into is we're not talking about a physical war. We're not talking about going out and fighting an actual war on the battlefield. We're talking about actually something that's more important than that. The souls of men. Spiritual warfare is way more important than the battlefield because the battlefield is just for a moment. But the souls of men and winning people to Christ, that's for all eternity. Heaven and hell, that's way more important. You know, if I die physically, what's that matter? It's where I go when I die. Right. Where's my soul go? Psalm 18, verse 32. And there, there's a, a certain verse here, you know, the famous verse where it says, He teaches my hands to war. But I want you to see the whole context of what's being said here. In verse 32, it says, It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my, my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war, so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy right hand hath holden me up, and thy gentleness hath made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, that my feet do not slip. I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. I have wounded them that they were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet, for thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued unto me those that rose up against me. Thou hast also given me the necks of my enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. Now we're talking about David, the man after God's own heart, the sweet psalmist of Israel here. And notice what he's talking about here, that God is going to teach his hands to war, so that he can bend, he can break a bow of, of iron. You know, it, it break uh, that is, uh, a bow of steel would be breaking by, broken by his arms. But look at this passage now, thinking spiritually, that you're going to consume your enemies with what? Words that no man can gainsay. With the word of God, which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing to the dividing asunder, even of uh, soul and spirit. The Bible is very clear that the word of God... It is, is, there's no weapon that's sharper than that. And what we're talking about tonight is a spiritual warfare and that God is going to teach our hands to war. And specifically, the Holy Ghost, because what is the Holy Ghost? The, the, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. And when we go out soul winning, we have the Word of God and the Holy Ghost is with us, bringing to remembrance those things which Jesus has told unto us in the Word of God. And that spirit is, is what's going to be used to, to preach hard sermons, to win people to Christ, to get through those battles, to deal with false prophets. And isn't that what 2 Timothy is dealing with? Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're dealing with Hymenaeus, if I lead this, and we're dealing with, Hymenaeus is brought up a lot, we're going to get back to Hymenaeus, but, but you know, this is what this is talking about, is being a soldier for Christ. And a soldier... You don't, just, you don't just go into a battle and then just take a vacation and not think about warfare. No, between the battle, if you're in a war, which we're in a war until we die. 
Make no mistake about that. This war hasn't ended. You know, when we had that, that big mega soul winning marathon, you know, that was a battle. But do you think the war's over for the souls of men? No, three more got saved today. And we had four, I think, saved at our church this past Tuesday. And, you know, and the last week we had others saved. And I'm sure the church has seen saved, you know, throughout the weeks. You know, the, the war's not over. Amen. But I want you to realize that there are battles coming. And you need to be prepared for it. Don't be idle in this time. When you have free time, when you have this time of peace where you're not being persecuted, use that to prepare yourself for the next battle. Amen. Because it's going to be easier when you have these times of peace and you're not being tested, you're not being shoved up against the wall to where you can just prove your weapon, prove your Bible. You know, get your Bible doctrine down pat. Psalm 144, you don't have to turn there, but Psalm 144 in verse 1, it says, Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. So this is something that's brought up over and over again, and we need to remember that God's going to teach us that. But we're not out to find the battles, okay? I want, I want to be clear about this. You know, we're preaching the gospel of peace. We're not, I'm not out there trying to find, picking a fight with people, okay? I'm not, we, we, we passed a, the Seventh-day Adventist church up here, that, around the church, and Holly's like, I don't think that's the church we're going to. <laughs> and she said, she said, you can preach here, but I don't think they're going to like it. I'm not going to find, I'm not going over to the Seventh-day Adventist and picking a fight with them. You know, like, I have better things to do, and I'm not out to try to find a fight with somebody, or, you know, but here's the thing, when the fight comes to me, I'll fight until I die. Amen. Yeah. And Psalm 120, Psalm 120, I want you to turn there and see this, because I want you to see David's heart on this matter. David was a man of war. David was a, a very valiant man. I don't think anybody would look at David and be like, that was a weakling, he's a coward, you know, or that he wasn't skillful in battle. But notice his heart on this. In verse uh, 6, so Psalm 120, verse 6. My soul hath long dealt with him that hated peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. David is for peace. He doesn't want to fight the battle. But when the battle comes to him, he fights. Amen. And you know what? If the battle does come to you, you better fight and you better win. And that's my attitude on that. If someone comes to me with a battle, I'm taking them out. Amen. Especially when it comes to these false teachers. I have no mercy for false teachers that are going to come at me with doctrines against the Trinity, against the fundamental doctrine of the faith. If they come against me with eternal security, you know, if they come against me with some foundational doctrine, the King James Bible, I will fight them until they die. But I'm not looking for it. Does that make sense? I'm not out there like... Well, where's the fight at? You know, no. I'm out there trying to win people to Christ. I'm for peace. But when I speak, they are for war. So when we're, we need to have that mindset. And if you remember, uh, Joab, the captain of David's host, killed two men when it wasn't war. He killed Abner because he killed his brother As uh, Asahel. And then he killed Amasa. Because pretty much he took his job. <laughs> okay. And uh, so he killed he killed those two men, and it says about that that he shed the blood of war in peace. In time of peace. So what that tells me is that hey, there's a time to war. There's a time to shed blood. But there's a time not to shed blood too. There's a time where I'm not out there just looking for bloodshed. But when that war comes to me then if there's going to be bloodshed, it better be, it's going to be there. That's the way I look at it. If they're coming to me with some false doctrine, I, I'll, I'll, I'll rip them to shreds. That's the way I look at it. But I'm not out there trying to just find people and be like, let me rip you to shreds. Does that make sense? So, uh, But if it comes to my doorstep and it, if there's people in my church that are being confused by it or it's, it's affecting you know, people in my church and they're confused, then, then I'm going to deal with that. And I'll rip it to shreds. But we need to have that attitude that we're not out there looking necessarily for those battles. And here's the thing. There's going to be no shortage of battles, my friend. Okay? There's going to be no shortage of persecution and battles. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So you know the battles are going to come. That's the thing I want you to realize tonight. It's not a matter of if the battle's coming to you, if persecution's coming to you, if tribulation's coming to you. It's a matter of when. Amen. 
And it's a matter of, are you ready? Are you preparing yourself now? You need to prepare now in the time of peace for that battle, for that war that's coming. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I kind of already mentioned this, but I want to really just show you that when I'm talking about that God's going to, he's going to teach our hands to war, we're talking about a spiritual battle. Yeah, I'm not saying that we need to all enlist in the army and go out and fight in the Middle East right now. That's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying we need to get God's army. And just because you're saved doesn't mean you're enlisted in the army. Okay? Just because you're saved doesn't mean you're a disciple. So we need to make that choice as a Christian that, hey, I'm going to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And we need to strive to be to be a good soldier. And you're saying you don't become a good soldier by osmosis. You don't become a good soldier just just from waking up in the morning and say, I'm a soldier. No, you become a good soldier from training, Amen. from experience, Amen. from fighting battles, from losing battles, winning battles. And don't be afraid to lose a battle, my friends. Mm -hmm. You're not always going to know everything when you're out soul winning. Right. You're not always going to know everything when someone comes up to you with a battle. But let me ask you a question. When they come up with you to you and give you a question that you can't answer, what are you going to do? Are you just going to fold up and say, I'm done with Christianity? Or are you going to say, next time they come with me at that, I'll have a good answer and I'm going to destroy them next time. Amen. Right. I remember a time when I was uh, I was traveling with my mom and I was a young Christian at this time. I was uh, I was saved and I was reading through the Bible, but you know I don't know if I had read through the Bible the first time yet. And some guy came up to me and and uh, we were at McDonald's, and we were just, you know, traveling home from Maryland. And this guy came up to me and asked me if I knew I was going to heaven. I was like, well, yeah, I actually do. You know, and I, I was actually kind of glad he asked me, you know. Because, and, uh, and I told him, and, and I said, well, let me ask you a question. You know, you're going to heaven, and do you think you can lose your salvation? He's like, oh, yeah, you can definitely lose your salvation. <laughs> I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, why are you even asking me? You know, if you don't know that you can know 100% sure and you can lose your salvation, why are you coming up to me and giving, asking me the question? But he gave me Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Mm -hmm. And he said, he said, see, he said to these people, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. And at the time, I didn't have a good answer for it. But I was so angry that I didn't have a good answer. I wasn't angry at God. I was, I was kind of angry at that person, you know, for trying to, for trying, to, trying to sway me out of, you know, what the Bible teaches about salvation. But I was angry at myself that I didn't know an answer to that question. Well, I made sure I knew the answer. I came back, and I was actually rooming with Brother Matt Stuckey at the time. And I told him about this, and we were studying that, and we're like, and what we found out is that's a, one of the best eternal security uh, yeah. passages in the yeah. Bible. And I yeah. use it out soul winning all the time. <laughs> because it says, uh, many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name have done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What, what did they say to have you do to go to heaven? Good works, prophesied in his name, cast out devils. Did they say anything about believing? Did they do the will of the Father? And it's like, oh, you got to do the, the will of God, which is to repent of your sins and all this stuff. I'm like, no, the will of the Father, this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone would see it, the Son, and believe it on him, may have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up in the last day. Amen. Amen. I know my sheep, and they hear my voice, and I give unto them eternal life. So did he ever know those people? That's actually a verse I use all the time now. True, amen. And I memorized. That was one of the, the those three verses right there, was one of the, uh, the few three verses that I had memorized at the very beginning of my Christian life. Why? Because I was challenged on it. And I didn't have an answer. And I got angry about it. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you going to get angry about it? Are you going to have righteous indignation for, for the false prophets out there and get maybe a little mad at yourself that you didn't have an answer? I think that's good. I think that puts you to the fire. I think that, that makes you stronger as a soldier. And, you know, there's, there's times where I'm out soul winning and I don't have a good answer. You know what? Next time I will. Next time they're not going to get me with that one. And so... But that takes experience. But uh, 2 Corinthians, that's where I had to go, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Notice verse 4. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought, to the obedience of Christ and having a read in a readiness to revenge all disobedience 
when your obedience is fulfilled. So what's our weapons? You know, we're not, we don't have carnal weapons. You know, I, I carry, I carry guns. You know, I, I'm all about shooting guns. Okay, I'm all about defending myself. I love the Second Amendment. And so I'm for being armed. I'm for defending yourself. I'm for, you know, practicing. You know, I practice all the time. I, used to, I, I shot competition pistol. I would practice all the time. And so hours and hours and hours of shooting. Why? To get better, right? But that's not what we're talking about tonight. If you don't know how to shoot a gun, that doesn't matter with what we're talking about tonight. What right. we're talking about is spiritual warfare. And our weapons are not carnal. Our weapons is this. The word of God. This is the, 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 the two-edged sword that pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints of marrow and is is the sermon of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is this is the weapon right here. This is the sword. This is the weapon that you need to practice with. This is the weapon that you need to prove. This is the weapon that you need to be in every single day if you want to be a good soldier for Christ. Any soldier, can you imagine a soldier that didn't pick up his weapon until the day of battle and said, all right, let's figure out how to use this thing? I mean... Do you think you're going to have confidence going into that battle? How about the person that spends two hours a day doing their sword play and drilling with people and doing all kinds of moves, making mistakes, getting cut, you know, doing all this stuff. And now when the battle comes, you know, it's going to be like second nature. And they're going to go out there and they're going to, they're going to prevail. Why? Because they, they strove for mastery. Go to Ephesians chapter 6, famous passage dealing with the whole armor of God. But again, I want you to see that we're not... We're not fighting a, a, a carnal battle. We're not fighting a battle of flesh and blood. Ephesians 6 and verse 10 there. Ephesians 6 and verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For notice this, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's the key. We don't, flesh, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. Notice why. Why are we doing this? Why are we taking on all this armor? Why do we have the sword of the Spirit? Praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that it may open my mouth boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as, old, as, as I ought to speak. So why do you put on that whole armor of God? Is it just to look good? Is it just to be puffed up with, hey, look at all the stuff I have on me. I, I look like a soldier. No, the reason you put on that whole armor of God and why you're shod with the, you know, with the preparation of the gospel of peace is to preach the gospel of peace. And all that armor is on you so that you can, you can take all those darts from the devil. You can take all the persecutions. And the sword is to stab, you know, all, all, you know, basically stabbing people with the word of God, essentially, right? You're trying to divide soul and spirit. You're trying to get them with the word of God to where they'll believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. That's what we're talking about here tonight. And I know I'm, talking to, I'm speaking to the choir tonight. Right? I'm speaking to those that go soul winning. This is a soul winning church. But I want you not to forget that. I don't, and I don't want to see where you have a mountain where you're just like, hey, we got this great victory. We're, we want all these people to Christ. Let's just take a break. No. No. You need to be looking at this like the fact, hey, there's another battle coming. Let's get ready for it. Can you think of a, bo a boxer? I, don't, I didn't really look this up to think about how long they take to train for a fight. But I know it's usually in the months, right? There's like months of time where they're training, dieting, getting ready for the fight. That's what you have to think about Christianity as. You have this big fight, it's time to train for the next one. Wow. And here's, here's the key, though. You don't know when that next fight's going to be. 
It could be tomorrow. It could be a week from now. It could be a month from now. It could be a year from now. But you have to realize that it's coming. Right? The pre-tribulation rapture is a false, false doctrine, right? We know that Christ isn't coming at any moment, but persecution and tribulation can come at any moment. Amen. I mean, that's what we believe about end times, right? We believe that the tribulation can, can happen at any moment. We don't know when it's going to start, but we know that when we see the abomination of desolation and, and all that, we know that we're in it, and that we know that it's not even at the door at that point, right? So we need to realize that with tribulation and persecution, that it, it's at the door. But uh, go to First Samuel chapter 17. This famous passage dealing with David when he, was, when he slew Goliath. So we know what the weapon, what's our weapon? The Word of God. The Word of God is our weapon. And the Holy Ghost is, I, I look at the Holy Ghost as like an armor bearer, right? You, you must have him there with you. And, and you know, kind of like Jonathan, he went up there and his armor bearer went with him. And he was slaying after him, right? And so, but the, the Word of God is our weapon. And the Holy Ghost uses that when we're out soul winning, when we're in our battles, right? But First Samuel chapter 17, verse 38 I want you to see something important when you're dealing with battle and when you're dealing with a weapon. In verse 38, it says that Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head, and also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with thee, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. That's the key here, is that David David basically took all of Saul's armor and took his sword. He took Saul's sword, and he says, I can't go with these because I haven't, I haven't proved them. What does that mean? It means he hasn't tested them. He hasn't used them. So he doesn't know how he would do with them. You know, you kind of think of it with a sword, you'd imagine you need to know how much weight it has, what you can do with it, what you can't do with it. And he never proved it. He basically just gave him a weapon. Now, I understand this dealing with guns. When you, if someone just handed me a gun, I wouldn't want to go in the battle just with some gun that someone hands me. Why? I haven't sighted it in. I haven't checked to see if it even works right. Right? There's a lot of things. I need to see how that thing functions. I need to see how I function with that gun. My eye, my my sight, my I'm left eye dominant, right handed. So a lot of times I have to adjust the sights based off of that. And not to get right. real technical with shooting right. here, but what I'm saying is that. I want to know, if I'm going to go out in the battle, I'm going to shoot my guns. I'm going to shoot the guns that I've shot and the guns that I've proved. And that's David's attitude here. Is he's saying, I have proved these things. And he goes down and gets some stones out of the brook and his sling and a staff. And why? Because that's what he's used before. He took out a bear and a lion. And apparently he used weapons like that to take them out. And so he takes something that's inferior when it comes to weapons but it actually would have worked better. He probably would have died if he would have tried to go down in a saw sword because he didn't know he, you know, he never used it. So what does that mean? That means that you need to prove the word of God. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. We need to study this. We need to prove it and prove it individually. Just because your pastor knows the Bible doesn't mean you're ready. And, and let me say this. Just because you watch YouTube sermons doesn't mean you're ready. Come on. Right. You need to learn this information on your own. And I'm all for listening. I listen to YouTube sermons, okay? I, I want to listen to other preaching besides myself now. I mean, like, you know, not that I don't like my preaching, but, uh, but the thing is, is that I want to listen to other people preach. I want to hear what they have to say. But I don't get all my doctrine from YouTube sermons. Amen. I get it from the Bible. Right. I'm reading the Bible. I'm figuring it out for myself. And here's the thing, you, if you're going to go out and defend a doctrine, you need to go through that menial task of plugging along, reading it, figuring it out, and going through all that exercise yourself. Anybody that knows anything about anything knows that when it comes to doing a job, you're going to learn more by what? Doing it. Right? If you watch someone do it, and you listen to someone do it, yeah, you can probably pick up some things here and there. But you're not you're probably not gonna be as good as if you just did it yourself or they they, they, they pushed you into it, you figured it out, you made some mistakes, and then you, you still you got through it, right? Has anyone ever here, you know, 
uh, road somewhere with somebody. And you're, you're looking at the road, right? You're talking to them, you're looking at the road. Have you ever got somewhere and be like, I have no idea how we got here. <laughs> That's me, okay? If I'm not driving, I have no idea. I'm just, I'm, I'm not in the zone. I'm not watching where we're going. I, I, obviously, my eyes are open. You know, I know we're turning places, right? But I'm not paying attention. Why? Because it doesn't depend on me that we run into a ditch somewhere, <laughs> right? But when you're driving, do you notice that when you drive somewhere, you can remember where you're going the next time? Why? Because you're the one doing it. And so we need to prove our weapons. Go to, and go to Hebrews chapter 5. Now, this is a very important point. Very important point. Because there's a lot of people out there, a lot of pastors, that, that have all this Bible knowledge. I'll use that loosely. Okay. <laughs> there's a lot of pastors out there that think they have a lot of Bible knowledge, or they have a lot of book smart, or they've read a lot of books, or they, you know, they... They, they're puffed up with knowledge, is what I'm going to say with this. But they don't do the work. They don't, they don't go out soul winning. You know, they, they, don't, they don't do what they're supposed to be doing. They're just saying, everybody else do this. I'm going to be up here, and I, I'm just, I'm, I'm working in the Word. You know, I'm working in, you know, I'm, I'm reading the Bible, and that's what I do. But what, notice in Hebrews chapter 5 here. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12. I love this passage. It says in verse 12, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as of need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Notice here, he's saying, hey, you, for the time, ought to be teachers. He's saying to you, you should be teaching people, but you have need that one teach you again. Which would be the first principle of the oracle of God, and, and are become such as need of milk. And he's saying, you should be teaching people, but you need milk. Why? Because the Bible says here, notice in the last verse, or the last verse there, verse 14, it says, by reason of use, having their, have their sense is exercised to discern both good and evil. Here's the key. You can read this all day long. But if you don't use it, you're going to be stuck on milk. That's right, yes, sir. You know there's a lot of truth to the fact that the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wineth souls is wise. Amen. Who do you think God's going to get more knowledge to? Who do you think God's going to get wisdom to? Who do you think God's going to uh, you know, un unveil the hidden man of the word of God? Do you think he's going to give it to the person that's all puffed up, Dr. Fat Bottom up here, that's up in his ivory tower, that just wants to look good, that wants to pontificate how much they've read the Bible? Or do you think that he's going to give the person that's out in the streets, winning people to Christ, fighting the battles, dealing with false doctrine, and doing the work of God, who do you think he's going to give more knowledge to? Amen. Who do you think he's going to give the strong meat to? Is it any surprise? Amen. That the, the preachers in our movement know more about the Bible, have more doctrine down than anybody else because they do the work. Amen. Amen. And that's what we need to remember when it comes to the Word of God, when it comes to fighting this warfare. Why? Why are the people that do the work have more knowledge than anybody? Because that's who God's going to bless them with. Because you're not using it. Why would God give you any more? It's kind of like if He gives you the milk saying, forsake not the assemblies. Right? You know, that's that's pretty simple. Come to church. Be in the house of God. Yeah. If you're not obeying that, or if you're not obeying reading the Bible, you know, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If you're not obeying that, why do you think he's going to, you know, help you figure out some of these hard passages? How do you think he's going to help you figure out James chapter 2? Philippians chapter 2, work out your own salvation with fear and tremor. How do you think he's going to help you figure out uh, Mark 16, 16, you know, where, where people are trying to say you got to be baptized and saved, or Acts 2, 38, you know, these hard, hard passages that people bring out. Why, why do you think a lot of these people don't have good answers? And they've read the Bible. Because they're not doing the work. Because they're stuck on milk. Amen. Why do you think they're struggling with, with simple truths of the Bible like the Trinity? Now, a lot of these people that are teaching this stuff, 
you know, that, that are pushing it are a bunch of false prophets and reprobates. But there's a lot of people that get sucked into this type of stuff. Even preachers, right? There's some preachers maybe getting sucked into it. Why? Because they're not doing work, therefore they're stuck on the mill. And they, they have need that one teach them again. And we have a lot of people that desire to be teachers of the law, but they, they understand neither what they say nor where they affirm. And so we need to remember that, hey, if, if you're gonna have if you're gonna prove that weapon, you need to use it. You need to use it. And you know, if you're going out soul winning every week, you're using it. You're using it. Hey, you're not gonna be you're not gonna be confused about the gospel. I, I don't meet soul winners that are winning people to Christ every week saying, Man, I wonder, I wonder if it's this repentance of sins is right. I wonder if you can lose your salvation. No, when you're giving the gospel, you know. 20 times in a week, or you're, every week you're just going through the gospel, going through the gospel, going through the gospel, going through the gospel. You're constantly being reminded by reason of use yes, that it's true. Yeah. That it's by grace through faith and not by works, and you can never lose your salvation because you're using it. But if you get out of church, I guarantee you, my friend, Amen. if you get out of church and stop soul winning, there may come a time where you're, where you're doubting yourself. And you're just like, you know, I, I, know it, I know I can't lose my salvation, but man, you know, you're just not that confident anymore. You're not ready to charge hell with a squirt gun, right? You're not ready to go after that person that's that's coming at you with, I can, you can lose your salvation. And it can happen to any of us, my friends. We, we need to all take heed to this. The Bible says in Proverbs 15 and verse 28, it says, The heart of the righteous study it to answer. Study it to answer. Why is this important? Why, we, why do we study the Bible? Well, to, make ourselves, uh, to show ourselves approved unto God. But a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, right? They divide and the truth. You know, when that person came up to me in McDonald's and you know was telling me, "Oh, you can lose your salvation," I was ashamed. Not of my God, I was ashamed of myself. I didn't have a good answer. But what 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 I do after that? I study to show myself approved unto God. And next time they didn't hit me with that. Actually, I use that verse. That's always that's always funny to me. <laughs> Is that the verses that these false prophets use? are the best verses against them. Amen. You know, it's like the, the Trinity deniers, right? Uh, John 14. John 14 was my text passage when I was dealing with the Trinity because it shows a perfect hierarchy of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. I'm like, it, it's hilarious. It's hilarious to me that, that the very chapter that's like their smoking gun of the fact that Jesus is the Father or there's no Trinity, so to speak, that that's the passage that actually proves them completely wrong. And so, uh, but it's the same thing with any other false doctrine. Usually that passage, you know, is, is, is the tool to, to deal with it. Now, uh, go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. So, the heart of the righteous study the answer. We need to study to show ourselves approved unto God. And if I can get anything out to you tonight, is the fact that when there's peace, when there's no persecution, this is the time to do it. Don't wait until that persecution comes. Because when that persecution comes, you're going to wish you had more time. You're going to wish you had more time to study into it and, and find that answer. Why not study now? Why not ask God? Here's, here's a question. We have not because we asked not. Why don't you ask God to show you a truth in the Bible of the next false doctrine that's coming up? You don't think that God knows what the next thing is coming up? Amen. And you know what? You know what? There's been some times where stuff has come out, and I'm like, I didn't memorize that passage, you know, or I was just thinking about that. When they brought it up, it was an automatic red flag. That's completely wrong. Here's a verse why. But maybe we should ask. You know, I'm, I'm talking to myself tonight. Maybe we should just ask God, hey, when I'm reading through the Bible, why don't you uh, show me the next thing that's coming down the pipe? I'll be ready for it. I believe God will do it. God knows the beginning from the end. He knows what next false doctrine is coming out. None of this stuff surprises him. You think he was surprised when this modalism garbage came out? You think he was surprised when the repentance of sins came out? You think he's surprised with any of these false doctrines that come out? There's nothing new under the sun. God knows the beginning from the end. And so why don't we just ask him to do that for us? Now, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14. And if there's a if there's a book dealing with persecution. And dealing with dealing with persecution and tribulations is first Peter. Okay, by the way. First Peter chapter three and verse fourteen says, But if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, and neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always 
to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conversation, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Notice, you're going to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And also, they're going to be ashamed, right? When you have a good conversation, when you have words that no one can gainsay, that they're going to be ashamed. You're going to leave them in dust. They're going to be ashamed, and they're going to, and and the Holy Ghost will give you something to say of what you what you've already remembered, right? What you remember. The Holy Ghost doesn't come down with a big booming voice saying, you know, Brother Jeff, say this. <laughs> you know, no. <laughs> The Holy Ghost is, go is going to bring to remembrance whatsoever Jesus told us, which is the Word of God, right? Yeah. So now the time of peace is the time for you to get all this in your, in, your, in your heart. Read it as much as you can. Memorize as much as you can. Because there's going to come a time when there's going to be a battle. You may not even have your Bible with you, but more so you should have your sword with you, you know, yeah. if you can. That battle's going to come, and then that's where the Holy Ghost comes in and starts bringing stuff to remembrance. And, you're, and have you ever been out soul winning where you thought of a verse and you're just like, I don't even remember memorizing that. You know, I, I'm like, I can't, I, can't, I can't remember the last time I even brought that verse up. But it just comes, it comes to you, right? But here's the thing, it's not like you never read it. It's not like you never heard it, right? It's not like someone's just like, I never read the Bible before, but man, that verse came to mind. It's like, what? <laughs> you know? Now, it's because you have read it, because you memorized it, because you've been proving your sword. And in that moment is where the Holy Ghost is going to use you. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, it says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. I'm just going to be, you know, candid with you. I don't want to be ashamed. I don't want to ever put my foot, my foot in my mouth. When it comes to any situation, I ask God... To give me the knowledge to know how to deal with every situation. You know there's a time to speak and there's a time to, to be silent. You know that there's a time to answer a fool according to his folly and there's a time not to answer a fool according to his folly. Let me ask you a question. Do you always know the time? I don't. Okay? I'm just being honest with you. That I'm constantly wanting to know how I ought to answer every man. But that comes from experience. That comes from reason of use. Okay. I'm not saying I've arrived. Okay, I haven't attained. Okay, but I'll tell you this: is that what, that's what I want. I want to know. Hey, when should I answer this person? When should I not answer this person? When should I just let them look like a fool? When should I answer them so that the the simple will see and beware? Right. So there is a time where you know if there was a false prophet out there and there's a whole bunch of people listening to him, where I'm gonna I'm gonna reprove him to his face and make him look ashamed so that everybody around will know that that guy's an idiot. But if I was just me and him and that person, I'd be like, you know, go get lost. Why would I waste my time? Does that make sense? So there's times to know discernment. There's a time to, to know when to speak, when not to speak. There's a, there's a time when to answer a fool and when not to answer a fool. But do you know all those times? Will you be ready to know how to answer that person or not to answer that person? That's where it takes study. That's where it takes time, experience. And you're going to fail. Listen, I've wasted time talking to a false prophet. I've been at the door for two hours with an evolutionist before. Wasting my time, right? But you know what that, what that does? It gives me experience to say, you know what, I'm not doing that again, right? And so we're all going to, don't be afraid to fail, okay? If you're preaching the gospel, God's for you. And if you waste your time at a doorstep, hey, just, just remember it next time. Remember it next time that you, you don't do it again, and you don't waste your time next time. Uh, but go to First Peter or First Timothy chapter one. I don't know when I started here, so <laughs> I might be going long on here. Preach on, preach on. <laughs> but First Timothy chapter one. You remember we read Second Timothy, and what you have to remember is that we're dealing with people that are bringing out false doctrine. So we're, when we're when we're preparing for a battle. You know, we're, we're battling soul winning all the time, right? So I'd, I'd say that's every week. We're not really, I don't want to say that, I mean, I, maybe you're prepared, you know, we have, you have the soul winning marathon tomorrow, and we have different events where we maybe we need to be preparing for a battle, you know, where you got a bigger event coming on. But we go soul winning every week. So, you know, that's kind of silly to be like, well, you know, we need to prepare every single week for that battle. 
But there, when I'm talking about battles, I'm talking about persecutions. I'm talking about hard times. I'm talking about, you know, dealing with false prophets, dealing with deaths in the family, dealing with uh, sorrows of heart, dealing with things that you don't expect to happen. Right? And how do you handle yourself in those situations? In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not the blasphemy. So notice, he's saying, find a good warfare. Why? Because there's two people right here that I've delivered unto Satan that they may learn not the blasphemy. So there's these two people that were blaspheming, and he's saying, hey, I, you know, you had these prophecies on you, you know, you had the word of God, and you need to learn to fight a good warfare. Well, that makes sense when you get into 2 Timothy, because 2 Timothy, in chapter 17, or I'm sorry, verse 17, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17, it says, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is what? Hymenaeus and Philetus. Man, he just keeps being brought up, right? Hymenaeus. The Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. So what do you have there? You have heresy that's within the church. And so we need to be ready for this. That's, that's in the same chapter where it says we need to be a good soldier of Christ. And when your pastor's dealing with this type of stuff, and he's dealing with, with, with uh, you know, false doctrines, you may say, well, I've already heard this before, or, you know, I already know the truth on that. So you need to be behind them, and you need to be saying amen. Even if it's a simple truth, even if it's something you know, you got it down pat, hey, we need to always be behind the man of God, and behind him, who, who, because he may know something you don't know. He may know something in the church. He may know, you know, that there's a problem somewhere that you don't know about. And he's not trying to announce that to everybody. He's not trying to, like, just make a big deal out of it. And he's trying to just nip it in the bud. Right. And, and so you need to be behind him and remember, hey, you know, he's the, he's the pastor. He's, you know, the under-shepherd that's trying to take care of the flock. And honestly, sometimes the, the sermons that I preach, and I don't have any problems at my church. Not yet, anyway, <laughs> right? But a lot of times the sermons that I preach are stuff that people bring up to me. They have a question about something. I'm like, all right, I'm preaching on that, right? Because I, I'm tending to what their needs are. I'm tending to what, what do you have a question about? What do you want to hear? What, you know, I'm not one of the pastors who be like, don't ever tell me what to preach, brother. <laughs> have you ever run into those yeah. preachers where it's just like, no, it's only what God gives me. You know, God is like coming down with this sermon and I have to preach what he tells me to preach. No, I, I usually preach what people have questions on or what I just want to preach on. Just to be honest, I'm reading through something. I'm like, that's interesting. I'm going to preach on that, right? And so uh, <laughs> there's this whole mystique about preachers sometimes where they think they're like, I'm not levitating up here. This thing's soft up here, but I'm not levitating. Okay? <laughs> I'm a little higher up. But I'm not an angelic being tonight, okay? I'm just a man. I'm just like you. I'm, 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 you know, I'm reading the Bible just like you are. And so uh, just remember, we need to fight this good warfare. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And that, going into that, <clears throat> this is why church is so important, okay? When we're going into these battles, why it's so important to have a church that you're attending and you're not going into these battles on your own. Because there's been times where I didn't have a good church or, you know, I was in between churches. I'm dealing with, you know, trying to find a good church. I was there. There's a reason why I started Mountain Baptist Church, my friends. <laughs> there is a reason. Because... You know, it's hard to find a good soul-winning, King James-only, Bible-preaching church. So in those times, you know, you're you think about yourself. Well, you know, when I just go soul-winning by myself, or when I just go out soul-winning and just ask somebody, I'm not representing a church, it never really works out too well. I'm not saying you can't win people, you know, because you can. But there's something to be said about having the charge. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. It says, who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? And that's what I want you to see there. Now, he's talking about his authority in this chapter. He's talking about, hey, I'm an apostle. And he's basically telling them, hey, I could, you know, they that preach the gospel should live by the gospel. He's basically saying, he's giving them his authority. He's saying, I have authority here. I haven't used it, but I have authority. And he's basically saying, who goeth a warfare? Or I'm, I'm sorry, in verse, yeah. 
Who goeth to warfare any time at his own charges? How shall they preach except they be sent? This is where you need a leader, okay? This is where the pastor comes in. This is you know, the leader of the church. You need someone that's leading the charge. And I say that again, leading the charge. Amen. Because you need someone that's going to be there with you, you know, and not just saying, go do this. Because I, I've been, you know, there was a church that we were helping out. Uh, I, Jeff, I, you remember it. Uh, we were helping out. We were trying to help them go soul winning. And, uh, and, and basically, we went down there, and, and a lot of people in there getting saved, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that whole, you know, a lot of church members are going out. Like, I wasn't even saved, and they were getting baptized. And that, that was a whole big deal. But anyway, <laughs> a lot of people getting rebaptized. But uh, so we went down there, and um, Pastor was super excited. You know, he was going out with us, and he was going soul winning with us. And we were going, we're going, we're going. And, uh, and then we kind of just said, okay, we're going to back off, you know, do your thing, okay? Because we're going to, we're going to the church that I got sent out from. So, you know, there's a lot of time when we were going to someone at our church and we're going to someone went down with them. There's a lot of time to do that. So we we're kind of cutting the umbilical, so to speak, right? Well, it worked out for a little bit. And there was a lot of people that were really excited about soul winning. But then the pastor said, you know what? I, I'm not against this. I'm all for going soul winning. But I want you guys to do it. I'm not going to do it. What do you think happened? Do you think there's someone going on someone down there? No. It never works, my friend. It never works. And I've been in churches where they don't go so winning. And, you know, I was, you know, I was there. And, you know, we're trying to push it. We're doing it. We're doing it. We're doing it. That's not sustainable. I would have fizzled out. I'm going to be honest with you. I told my wife. I said, and then I, here's the thing. But the church I was sent out from, they were going soul winning, okay? But, I, you know, I needed hard preaching. I needed, I needed some. I need something else. I need something more than just going there and being in church, okay? But, but the thing is, I, I told my wife, I said, this is the end game. I'm either starting a church or we're moving. Because I know that I can't, I can't sustain this. I can't, I can't just do this the rest of my life like this. I'll fizzle out. And so, but you need a man that's going to charge, that's going to lead that charge. You need someone that's going to, that's going to give that charge, right? And so don't forget that. Be behind your man of God. And, and, and here's the thing. He's human. I'm human. You think I always want to go soul winning? <laughs> okay. I sometimes just want to go home and go to bed. Okay. I'm going to be honest with you. I work a full-time job. And I, I, you know, I love my job and everything, but it's stressful. It's hard. It's, you know, and, and doing church and doing, and, and dealing with my children, you know, uh, and you know, I love my children, but it's work. Everything, all that's work. Yeah. And there's some days I just want to collapse. I don't make it to my bed half the time. I, you know, I, that's my biggest chore is like, I got to brush my teeth and make it to my bed before I pass out. Right. And that's something that, that, that's hard. So, so you need to be behind your pastor. You need to be. You need, you need to realize that he's not some Superman that just has this 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 extra energy that that you don't have or something like that. So we're all human, but you also need someone to follow. Now, uh, go down in the chapter there in verse twenty-five. Notice what it says in verse twenty-five. It says, "Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things." Now, they that do it obtain a corruptible crown, but we, an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as, so, and so, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And this is Paul's argument. I think it was Brother Jeff, I think it was you that was preaching. Was it you that said that that, uh, that Paul didn't shadow box? Or was that Brother Stucky? I can't remember. I, I think you preached a sermon on like... But anyway, I always think of you when I read this passage now. But one beating the air, right? And I, and I do kind of think of shadow boxers, right? Now, if anybody shadow boxing me, I'm not against you. Don't fight me, please, okay? Uh, I wrestled. I didn't box. <laughs> but, but all I have to say is that with this, he, he's understanding, hey, I can be taken down too. Does that make sense? The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul. One of the greatest Christians that you'd ever read of in the Bible, he's understanding, hey, I could be a castaway too. So we need to keep ourselves in check and remember, hey, when that battle comes, when that fight comes, 
We want to be prepared to where we're not a castaway. I don't want to be there. It's a little more embarrassing when the pastor's a castaway, right? So I hold myself to a higher standard when it comes to this, this area, and I don't want to ever be in that position where I'm castaway, right? And what does it mean by that? It just means that you're, you're not living for God. You're in sin somehow. You know, you're not doing what you should be doing, right? So that's where that comes in. Now, remember the battles are going to come. And, and go to First, in, uh, First Thessalonians chapter 3. As you're going there, remember I said uh, in 2 Timothy, it says, Yea, and all that will live godly shall suffer first, and, and Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 21, it, in verse 22, I'm sorry, it says that, that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. But just remember this, that this is something that is, you know, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, trial as though some strange thing happened. This is not strange that we're going through persecution. This isn't strange that battles are coming about. This isn't strange about any of this stuff that we see in the Bible. This is just commonplace. We need to remember that. Now, it says here in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, and verse 3, it says that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we were we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. Notice we're appointed unto that. So again, what, what are we talking about tonight? We're talking about the fact that we need to prepare for war in time of peace. Why? Because we know battles are coming. You know, and some of you may be going through battles right now. I'm not saying, you know, not everybody's in the same place. It's not like the whole church collectively, peace, battle, peace, right. battle. You know, everybody's kind of in their own, they have their own warfares that they're dealing with, right? But if you're in a time of peace right now, my friends, if you're in a time of peace, take this opportunity to prove your weapon. Take this opportunity to, to get skillful in the Word of God. You know, find a, find a topic you'd be like, well, I don't know what I need to get skillful on. Find a doctor. Find a doctor and say, you know what, I'm going to know that thing in and out. I'm going to look up, you know, baptism, for example. Look up every word where baptism is mentioned and understand every passage. You know, rule out the ones that are easy, get into the ones that are hard, and figure it out. And here's the thing, read, 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 read. If I can say anything to anybody over and over again, it is to read your Bible. Amen. Don't neglect the reading. Give attendance under reading. That's the biggest problem I see even in our movement is people watching sermons and not reading it for themselves. Right. And I can always tell the people that read your Bibles, the people that listen to sermons. Because when you talk to them about doctrine, the person that read the Bible is like verses are coming to their mind. They're just thinking about these verses. Verses here, verses here, verses here. And then when it's someone that just listens to the sermon, it's like, well, Pastor Anderson said this over here. And Pastor Jimenez said, and listen, I love those guys. They're great men of God. But, you know, where's your mind at? And you're always going to be thinking and probably talking about things that have been on your mind. You can't help it, right? You know, songs can't get out of your head, you know, it's on your mind. Are those hymns? Are those, and now here's the thing, I've, been, I've had this stupid jingle, you hear those jingles out there, you can't get out of your head, right? Okay, and every time I have a jingle or some song will get in your head, I'm just like, to God be the glory. I'm just like, anything to get that out of my head, right? But when it comes to the Bible, that's what it needs to be. It needs to be to where you're, you're, you're subconsciously just even thinking about it. You know, like, I'm mowing the grass. I saw like with this, this whole flat earth thing came up. And there's a flat earth in here. I God bless you. But, uh, but this whole flat earth thing came up. And I'm out there mowing the grass. And I'm like thinking about the structure of the earth. Because I'm a structural engineer. So I'm a nerd halfway anyway. So I'm thinking about structures. And then I was thinking about verses in the Bible and how they work together. And I'm like, that makes perfect sense. But it's because what am I thinking about? Well, I'm thinking about work. But I'm also thinking about verses in the Bible. Right? And so that's where, what are you doing? You're proving your weapon. You're sharpening. And, you know, and I'm not saying that was that important. The flat earth discussion is not exactly the biggest doctrine we need to debunk today. But I'm just saying is that we need to be ready. And the last thing I'm going to show you is Jude, Jude in verse 3. 
We need to be diligent in this, okay? We don't need to be idle. That's the big thing I want to say to you. Don't be idle in these times of peace. When you have, you, everything's going good. You know when things are going good? I'm actually more nervous. <laughs> when things are going, I'm like, man, things are really good right now. What's about to happen, <laughs> right? Because you just know it's not always going to stay that way. And, and here's the thing. I don't want it to stay that way because if it did, I would end up being a bad pastor. I'd be a bad Christian because those hard times are good for you. Those hard times are going to make you a better Christian. They're going to they're going to harden you up, right? It's going to thicken your skin. It's going to get you ready for that battle. You know, it's kind of like if uh, if you go into a fight. When I wrestle, that first grapple was always the hardest because you kind of have like you get that first hit. It's almost like you want someone to punch you in the face once, and then you're ready to go, right? And that's when it comes to battle. Is that hey, if you're just constantly in the battle and you're constantly getting hit, you know, then you're not, you know, you're not going to get caught off guard, right? But Jude one, one obviously, you have Jude two, so that helps. But uh, this is the last verse I'm going to show you here. It says, "Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints." Contending, we're fighting. We're contending with them that forsake the law. We're fighting a battle. That battle is coming, my friends. You may be in a time of peace right now, but just remember that it's coming. It's inevitable. So get ready for it. Sharpen your swords. Don't get out of the fight. The war's not over, my friends. The war's not over until we die. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And it says, I am in a straight betwixt two having a desire to part and be with Christ. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And we need to remember that, that. Why are we here in the flesh? Why did God not just take us out of here? Because he has a job for us to do. It's more needful in the flesh for me to be here and to preach the gospel to every creature. And as long as I'm breathing, that's our job. And that's your job. Right? And so that's what, we, that's what I wanted to share with you tonight is, you know, you're soul winning, you know, it's a great church, you got a great spirit, you know, and, and, and that's why Mountain Baptist Church is like that. I don't want to lose that. I don't, I, and I told my members, I said, listen, there's going to be a time where you're going to realize that this is just church, right? You're going to forget all that other, you know, like dealing with churches that, that didn't preach right on certain doctrines, right? And you're just going to maybe get acclimated to it. Try not to get acclimated. Try to always remember, hey, what you have here. This is not common. We have a church that's going out soul winning like this. And it has a heart for soul winning like that. So don't get in a time of peace or victory, so to speak. Victory can beat you in the end. You need to be constantly knowing that that battle's coming. It's not over until you die. So that's not what we're trying to do. Dear Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for Pastor DeLello and Friendship Baptist Church and just all these that are gathered here tonight. And Lord, just pray that you would uh, help us all to be prepared for that next battle. And Lord, to, to not be seeking uh, bloodshed, but Lord, when it comes to our doorstep, that we'll be ready for it. And Lord, that we win the battle. And Lord, through you, all, of course, Lord, and we just pray that you would prepare us for that. And Lord, I pray that you get safe travel tonight. And Lord, just give us safety and, and bless the fellowship. We love your fellowship in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.